Welcome, friends. Thank you so much for joining us in our study of the Book of Books. We have been studying for the past weeks a subject that has to do with a doctrine that has been around a long time. It is called generally by the term Calvinism. And although at one time it was almost universally held among those that were Protestants and even among Catholics, Yet, many, perhaps most of its points, have long since been rejected. The doctrine is built upon the foundational doctrine that was believed Augustine and by Calvin and other other scholars of his day, that God before the worlds began, determined everything that was going to happen as far as that world was concerned, and decreed that it would happen, and that it was so fixed that it could not be changed in so much as a number of one plus or minus one. The doctrine has five points. The first of those points is hereditary total depravity. Man is a sinner, born so because he inherits sin from Adam. We showed the folly of that. That God has said that the Father does not bear the iniquity of the Son, the Son does not bear the iniquity of the Father. The second is the matter of unconditional election. That is, that God determined who would be saved and there would be no conditions as far as man was concerned. God would save him in his own time and if he was determined to be lost and God had chosen that he should be among the lost, well, there was nothing he could do to be saved. The third point is the doctrine of limited atonement. And that doctrine is, is that Jesus didn't die for everyone. He just died for those that he elected to be saved. The fourth point was the matter of a irresistible grace. By this, the founders of the doctrine insisted that when God, God, when God got ready to save a sinner whom he had decreed he was going to save before the foundation of the world, that he would send his enabling grace into the heart of that man to allow him to believe, to cause him to believe. And that man cannot resist when God sends that enabling grace. The final point is the doctrine of the perseverance of the saints. We know it more familiarly with the expression, once saved, always saved. Most of the four of these earlier points have been rejected. It is the fifth doctrine, the one that we shall study today, that still lingers, believed by many, many individuals, perhaps not upon the basis of its scripturalness, but because it gives of comfort to individuals. The doctrine is based upon the fact that the doctrine said that when God gets ready to save a man, he will send his enabling grace, and he can't resist it once he's saved. He's always saved. As we look at this doctrine, however, we must recognize something. Salvation is conditional. It is not God alone who acts in salvation. Man also acts in salvation. We must recognize that the Scripture teaches that salvation is conditional before one is forgiven of his sins. And after one has been forgiven of his sins, remaining steadfast is something that also is conditional. Notice, First John, the first chapter, verse 7 says, If we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus' his Son cleanseth us from all sin. Here's a wonderful promise. The blood of Jesus cleanses me from my sin. And... It does so conditionally. And what is this condition? If I walk in the light. But there is no promise that the blood will cleanse one single soul if one turns from the white and walks in darkness. Further, we find that the scripture says that uh, you're made partakers with Christ if you hold fast the beginning of your confidence firm unto the end. So I will share with Christ but there's a big if there. And what is a big if? 
if I hold fast the beginning of my confidence firm unto the end. But suppose I don't. There is no assurance that I'll be made a partaker of Jesus Christ. The Bible said that why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not the things that I say? The Bible said not everyone that enter into the uh, heaven, not everyone that saith me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Then Jesus said that uh, he that is one that does his will is one that will enter into heaven. Jesus said that he that rejecteth my words and receiveth not him that sent me hath one that judgeth him. So the Bible teaches that I can accept and be blessed or I can reject and suffer the consequences. Moreover, the Bible not only tells us that, the Bible is very specific. It warns, yes, it warns that falling is a distinct possibility. We find it in the book of Hebrews, the writer said that you're made protectors with Christ if you hold fast the beginning of your competence firm unto the end. And the Bible teaches, take heed, brethren, lest happily there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in falling away. There's that word. In falling away from the living God. And the apostle says, take heed, lest you fall. So the Bible teaches, yes, I can fall. Paul wrote to the brethren that were in the churches of Galatia, they were troubled by a false doctrine. And uh, the apostle warns them about that. Warns them that you are severed from Christ. Those of you who were justified by the law, ye are fallen away from grace. Notice what he said. If you accept the law, two things. You are severed from Christ. The Bible teaches in him is life, and the life is the light of man. If I'm severed from Christ, I am severed from that life. But my friend, no man can be severed from Christ unless he is first joined to Christ. So the apostle said, you're severed, you're cut off from Christ. If you would accept the law and be justified by the law, and then Paul said something else. Those words that man says you cannot do, he said, ye are fallen away from grace. You know, it is a tragedy to me that individuals would flatly deny in the face of what God has said, what God has said. Man says once you're saved, you're always saved. But God said through the Apostle Paul, you are severed from Christ those of you that will be justified by the law. You are fallen. There's that word. Fallen from grace. Can man fall from grace? Paul said one could. Modern preacher says you can't. But my friend, I'm going to trust in what Paul said and not what a man may say. In 1 Corinthians, the 10th chapter, the apostle gives to the brethren at Corinth a lesson from the past it is the lesson of Israel when they came out of Egypt working toward the land of Canaan. When they were in the wilderness, they were separated from the slavery of uh, uh, Egypt just as we, when we were baptized into Christ and yet still alive, are separated from the sins of the world. But we're not in heaven yet. And those Israelites weren't in, e in uh, Canaan yet. They were in the wilderness and yet with most of them in the wilderness, God was not pleased. They were overthrown. They were overthrown. Now, what was Paul's point in reciting all these things that happened unto the ancestors of, of those that were Jews? His point was this, that uh, these things are written for an example to us, that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. And then he concludes, Wherefore, wherefore, let him that think of his stand take heed lest he fall. Yes, you can fall. I can fall. And Paul says, I need to take heed lest I do. And you need to take heed lest you do. Paul knew that he could fall from grace. When he wrote to these Corinthians, 
in his prelude to the things in the 10th chapter, he wrote in the ninth chapter these words, those that run in a race run all, but one receives the prize. Even so run that you may also obtain. And then Paul says, I buffet my body and bring it into subjection. Why, Paul? Lest by any means, after that I have preached to others, I myself could be a castaway. Could Paul fall even though he had served God faithfully all these years? He said he could. And he said he could because the Spirit was speaking in him. Paul knew he could fall from grace. I know I could fall from grace. And you can call for, fall from grace whether you know it or not, my friend. For God has made your primary salvation conditional and your eternal salvation also conditional. God's done not his part. I've got to do my part. The church in Laodicea had fallen. Jesus, through John, wrote to them, urged them to repent and to correct their way. And one of the sweetest, most tender invitations and exhortations is the last appeal that Jesus made to this Laodicean church. He said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man will hear my voice, I will open the door, and will open the door. I will come unto him, and I will sit with him, and I shall be his God. So we find that Jesus said, I'm knocking but I'm not going to break the door down. You're going to have to open the door. But if you do open the door, I will come in with you, sup with you, and you with me. Friend, it's an ugly picture of a man who has begun and walks away. Peter gives us that picture. It's not a lovely picture. And one we don't like to read about, but it's there for our edification and to warn us. In Second Peter, the second chapter of the Apostle wrote, if after they have escaped from the defilements of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and overcome. The latter end is worse with them than the beginning. It were better for them never to have known the way of righteousness than after knowing it to turn back from the holy commandment delivered unto them. It's happened unto them, according to the true proverb. The dog turning to his vomit again and the sow that have washed to her wallowing in the mire. Now notice, uh, here are individuals that Peter said they had escaped the defilements of the world. How? Through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. If after they've done that, if they've been saved, if they turn back to those things again, wherein once they escaped, that latter end was worse than them than the beginning. Then give a very pretty picture. He said, it's like a, a dog turning to something that makes it sick. It vomits it up and goes back and eats it again and like to a sow that's washed, that goes back to the mire and becomes dirty all over again. Someone seeks to offset the thrust and the power of this illustration by saying, well, just remember that that sow never changed its nature. It still was a sow. Well, my friend, that's to beg the question. The fact is that the sow was first a dirty sow. And then when she washed, she was a clean sow. And... Uh, then when she went back to her wallowing in the mire, she was dirty again. The Lord teaches, yes, one can be saved and then be lost, lost eternally. What a sad thing. Thank you for studying with us this day, and we hope that you followed with us through all of these studies. And if you haven't, it's the first time that you've listened to us. All of these are still recorded for your edification. Go back and read them, watch them, and read along from the scriptures and be edified. Thank you, friends, for having studied with us.